Okay, now all that's done. We all know you're here for the big show. Give FX a huge round of applause for the schooling on disassemblies he's going to give you right now. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. Um, so, uh, welcome to tutorial session. I am a little bit surprised at how many people actually want to build custom disassemblers. Uh, <laughs> But that's a good development. Um, so um, what I'm, what I'm going to cover is not just building a disassembler, but building a disassembler for an instruction set where you don't have a documentation. Um, with most instruction sets, um, you do get a documentation. And why are my slides cut off? Uh, that is suboptimal. Anyway, so um, you're missing the bullet points. <laughs> um, so we're going to um, quickly talk about the motivation behind this talk, um, a introduction to the, to the field. Um, it, is, it is not a regular CPU that you're dealing with on a daily basis, so um, we have to cover a little bit of groundwork. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how we find the bytecode, how we recognize it, how we see basic properties of the bytecode, um, how we implement an IDA um, CPU module, um, to put the disassembler into IDA. Um, oh, great. Thanks for fixing it. Um, and um, some more advanced topics that you're going to face if you want to write like a complete disassembler. And then we end up reading some code that we're not supposed to read. Um, so the, the general motivation is like this. This is what you get, and IDA tells you uh, I don't know what to make of it. The story behind this is a little bit embarrassing um, because it taught me that I'm no longer a teenage hacker. Um, I got a call from a friend um, who worked on um, the Stuxnet case. And he asked me whether um, I know any old fart, that was his saying, that still learned PLCs, um, which happened to match to myself. Uh, <laughs> so I ended up dealing with this part of it. Um, so, more specifically, um, in June 14 this year, uh, Frank Baldwin, an um, independent researcher who is not working for antivirus companies, um, actually figured out that um, the, the antivirus companies were so um, busy jerking off about the fact that there was an LNK zero day in Stuxnet that they completely missed the fact that it had payload that actually did something interesting. Um, a lot of people started speculating um, about Stuxnet, and still do. Uh, very few people actually read the code. Um, here's, here's a general recommendation. Um, read the fucking code or shut the fuck up. Um, <laughs> and so in, in the Stuxnet uh, code, uh, there were a couple of blobs that were apparently PLC code and those needed to be analyzed, and um, the, analyzed, uh, the, the information that you could get off the internet wasn't really reliable and wasn't actually coming in um, the speed that uh, was required to figure out what Stuxnet actually does. So, intro, now we need to look at PLCs, right? Um, the stuff that I learned PLCs on in professional school is actually like this little thing to the right. Um, it's a very simple um, programmable input-output controller, essentially. It's designed for electrical engineers, um, not for programmers. And it's actually just designed to um, virtualize, as we would say today, um, and abstract a fixed wiring um, configuration of an automatism. Um, the, the default axis um, you have digital inputs and outputs that you can program, and there's mostly there's some um, analog um, digital converters connected to them, and then you can you know drive motors or pumps or dildos or whatever. Um, you can actually do that. Um, <laughs> so it's from a from a programming perspective, um, it's a it's one register machine. It actually has. Um, Usually only one register and accumulator register. And newer ones have more than one accumulator register, but you can't address them directly. Um, modern PLCs, as I had to learn the hard way, are a lot more complex. So how do you program those? This is fairly interesting. Um, the programming of PLCs um, 
So the PLCs are all vendor specific. However, the programming is actually standardized um, by the IEC um, in the 61131 standard. Um, they also standardized other interesting stuff like uh, VHS video and uh, 19 inch racks. Um, and what they, what they define is a set of programming languages. The first one is the uh, most common, commonly known ladder diagram. That's what you see up here. Um, it actually looks like an electrical engineering um, wire up painting. Um, then there's the function block diagram. This is from Wikipedia. This is actually part of the, um, of the Genesis project, uh, Gemini project. Uh, from NASA, they somehow gave it to Wikipedia for whatever reason. Um, to the English one, of course. Um, the Germans deleted it. Um, <laughs> the, then you have a, um, a, a structured text representation that you can write in that pretty much looks like Pascal uh, with all its beauty. Um, then you have the instruction list, uh, which is the closest you can get to the feeling of an assembly. And then you have a sequential function chart. Uh, you can already see that it's fairly complicated um, just to you know, uh, use a sequential function chart just to open and close the door, um, manually, <laughs> that is. Um, the IEC also defines a standard set of libraries. Um, think of it like your libc. Um, there's just a standard set of um, instructions, um, functions. So, the PLCs actually don't natively execute, um, execute the code that you're putting on them. Uh, most of the older ones that are still in use actually emulate the code, so there is, there is an actual operating system layer, thin layer on top of the real hardware. Um, the, the real modern ones um, now use ASICs uh, that can natively execute this, uh, this bytecode. And what you need to keep in mind with PLCs is that they execute in so-called scans. So um, you don't have a continuous execution as you would expect it from a regular CPU, but you have a, like a hamster wheel uh, cycle that goes, it reads all the inputs, converts them, you know, you have an analog input. Uh, if you digitalize it, you need to set a defined point in time uh, when you take the measurement. And this is what is done first. Um, then the main code is executed with all the other code that might be called from the main block. Um, and then the outputs are set according to what the code did, right? Relatively simple. Um, now, if you're, if you're dealing with, uh, with PLCs, um, you always have something like a programming device. Um, and here, um, to the left, you see the, the easiest and, and smallest version of a programming device. And this is all you need to actually program a PLC. Nobody does that anymore. People use Windows applications and um, you know, fancy GUIs and stuff. Um, but this is actually like the, the most minimum programming device that you can have. Um, if you obtain one of those, um, you should not go to um, like the... the Mm, automatic casinos that we have in Germany, you know, with the, with the uh, coin automats, because those people get really nervous. Um, <laughs> they totally don't like you having that device with you. Um, so, when you look at um, the, the PLC structure, to the right we have the inputs and outputs that are somehow connected to the whole thing. And then, um, what you see in the, um, on top at the system memory part, uh, it's called the process image input table and output table. Those are the tables that actually get uh, the digital measurements um, or set the digital um, outputs. And those are fairly important for the PLC because this is what the PLC thinks it sees on its sensors. Um, then, you know, you have a bunch of uh, system blocks, code data blocks, and then to the left you see the, the programming device um, where you have the user program, a symbol table, um, and the hardware configuration. So, um, enter the Siemens specifics. <laughs> Siematic S7 um, and the Step 7 programming environment. Uh, Siematic is a is, um, word combination from Siemens and Automatic. Um, they, under this brand, they build PLC since uh, 73. Uh, now you're probably seeing why I was asked about the old fart. Um, 
they're actually doing it longer than I exist. Um, the, for the step 7 or S7, which is current now, um, the, the bytecode is called MC7. And um, the development environment is called step 7 for Steuerung einfach programmieren. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> um, in English, controllers easily programmed or fucked up. Um, they do support a couple of the IEC languages. Um, they have the, um, the letter logic and the, the function plan and all that. Um, and here you see German abbreviations um, in here. Uh, that's because this is built for electrical engineers and Siemens being a German company, they actually internationalized the programming language. So um, be really careful if you look at step seven code, it might be German. Um, because a German electrical engineer cannot be bothered to understand that end is A, so they actually have a German instruction set version that has UN for an end operation. Um, <laughs> this is why you actually need to know like both um, abbreviations, because all of them are translated. Um, they have four other optional um, programming environments. Um, full PLC simulation package, including a hardware design package where you can drag and drop like your PLC stuff so you can simulate it, and a couple of tools to talk to the PLCs and debug them and stuff like that. Um, the software is, can be obtained with a 14-day uh, free trial, so uh, for the purpose of writing our disassembler, uh, we don't actually need to pay for it. Um, of course, there's other ways to get the software. Um, and as Miko pointed out, it's fairly obvious that Iran runs <laughs> the software too. <laughs> and apparently whatever their purpose was, it wasn't 14 days. So <laughs> okay, so this is how it looks like um, when, you, you know, when you program in this. Um, and this is, as you see, the, the English version. Um, and the, the actual code is the little block in the, in the middle that has A and equals and stuff. And then um, what you do when, you, when you're starting to look um, for the byte code, you should not try to export, like compile code and export it into a file format because then you're facing two problems. You're trying to understand the file format and you're trying to understand the bytecode. So what's a lot better is to get a simulation environment, uh, which is shipped uh, with this tool set. Um, so this is how the, how the simulator looks like, pretty trivial. Um, and then you take regular Windows tools, like the Process Explorer, and go and explore where this tool is actually writing to. In this case, it is writing into a temp file um, and it's writing to that all the time when you say compile and load it into the simulation environment. So then um, you simply start a clean PLC and write some code in that and then compare the two. Actually, I wrote this tool for, uh, for barcode analysis and it, it turns out to be quite useful uh, for that type of work as well. So what you see to the left is this temp file that the, that the emulator works on. Um, and in the, in the clean form, and what you see to the right is the same file, um, but the, the darker pixels are uh, bytes that have a value um, different from zero. The darker the byte, the, the more Fs in there. <laughs> um, before you, like, once you have this initial foothold and you know where you can get the byte code from, um, you should actually familiarize yourself with this environment. That's easily, um, the most painful part in the whole exercise because you actually have to learn it, to use it the way the, the original vendor um, wanted you to use it. It's helpful to have basic introduction material. You should actually go through the basic introduction material and learn what the programming and debugging cycle in this environment is um, because you will do it a lot and it will definitely help you to be familiar with the basic steps and not fail at the basic steps all the time when you're hunting for like one bit that you're, that you're lacking at some point. Um, what's very helpful, because vendor documentation tends to suck, what's very helpful is um, looking at university websites um, and, and looking transcri for transcripts from students that had to learn this 
bullshit for some reason and never used it again. Um, so here's an overview of the STL, um, of the assembly-like um, language um, in, in um, step seven. So uh, what, you, what you see here, like, for example, the big logic instruction, the equal sign is a instruction. So um, the same holds true for um, larger than and smaller than. Um, that actually got a couple of tools that I was using, um, using this, this code with uh, because they used as an internal data representation, they used XML. And <laughs> they didn't expect that instructions actually have a greater than sign um, themselves. So that <laughs> kind of broke them. Um, so, in general, what you have is the bit logic instructions are the most important on a PLC because they work on the inputs and outputs. Uh, you have comparison in instructions, of course, uh, so you can do conditional code flow. Uh, you can convert. Um, you have counters. Counters are uh, natively in, in PLCs. They're a very important concept. The same holds true for, um, for timers. Um, then you have data blocks. Um, the PLC is from, uh, from the MC7 bytecode level. Um, it is not a um, von Neumann architecture. It actually feels more, uh, from the programming point of view, it feels more like a Harvard architecture. So you cannot mix code and data easily. Uh, so what you actually do is you have um, different types of data blocks. And of course, instructions to deal with them. Uh, logic control, um, conditional jumping, integer math, floating point, uh, loading and transfer, um, which is needed a lot because you only have one fucking register, um, shift, timer, word logic, and the accumulator instructions. So there's quite a lot to cover. So how do you start recognizing your code? Um, you start with the most basic functionality that you can find. So uh, you're looking for um, something very simple. In the PLC case, it was loading a small value into the accumulator register. And then you do that multiple times. Um, that's, the, and that's the easiest way to actually recognize the pattern in hex when you, when you look at the hex dump, right? Um, if you can, use hexadecimal not uh, notation right away. Uh, because if you type hacks, then it's easier to recognize it or recognize if it's missing. So here we do have a case where um, I just loaded 7F uh, frequently into, into the code. I'm too short, Tim. Um, and so you, you already see a pattern where 7F shows up um, on a regular basis all, the, all four bytes. Um, what's fairly important is to start with small numbers. Like, do not load... Um, 31337 um, as your initial value. It, it might look lead, but it's actually a dumb move um, because instruction encodings tend to be different for large and small numbers. Um, this is step two. You're increasing the size now of the immediates that you're loading and see whether the instruction actually changes, whether you're dealing with um, multiple instructions that do the same thing, but depending on the size of the operand, are different, or whether it's a sane instruction set. This being Siemens, uh, of course, the first is the case. Um, the second thing that you then can do is uh, you take those loading instructions that you now automatically recognize with your pattern matching brain. Um, so you actually have to use your brain. Um, you take those loading instructions and you use them as markers. So that when you put a instruction between those two markers, you can now tell the length of the instruction. I say it again, do not try to understand the file format that the bytecode ends up in. Uh, it wouldn't help you, it wouldn't do you any good. Um, it just distracts you. So here's an example um, where I use Kaffee and capital A's um, and FIFA uh, for, um, for markers. And then since I already know what the loading instruction is, um, I can tell that the knob one is the FF in the middle. And if you're paying close attention, you will also see that the immediate values that we put there, um, like FIFA, FIFA is not turned around. 
So we can tell the NDS, right? Everyone knows what NDS is, right? Okay, <laughs> just checking. Um, and then you can actually automate the process. So what I did was writing um, preprocessor pre scripts, essentially, um, that I could feed code in, and then it would put the markers there and increase the number um, at the marker, and then after assembly, I could take the hex dump in a very short Perl script, yes, I do Perl, um, and have them sort it out. So what you end up with is uh, with this notation here where you have the marker and the, the counter in the marker and then the instruction you're interested in. What about documentation? I've seen many people writing disassemblers um, and saying, well, the documentation is in the code. Um, or this is so cool programming language itself documenting. Um, no, when you do this, you actually have to document manually um, what you find out about the instruction set because it's the only way for you afterwards to figure out if you had a coding glitch or if you decoded a instruction incorrectly at some point. So that's the only way afterwards to verify your disassembly. And I can tell you nothing is more disappointing than trying to understand a piece of code for many, many days and then realizing that your disassembler fucked up especially if it's your own disassembler. Um, document strictly in binary is something that helped me a lot, and you're going to see why in a minute. Um, and have examples. Like for every single instruction you write down, have an example how it looks like and code it. Um, so the reason I'm documenting this in binary is because you then start to see patterns. So here's two instructions. Uh, one is a load into an address register one, and one is a transfer into address register one. And you can, since we documented it in binary, you can tell that they're only um, one bit apart. And then you can uh, take another load instruction and see whether this bit actually, when you flip it, turns it into a transfer instruction, which happened to be the case. So it makes your documentation a lot more dense and it makes the code that you're going to write a lot better. Um, well, and then you start with the most native instructions. Um, so for, for a regular CPU, that would be um, byte operations, you know, end byte and another byte, or, you know, loading into all registers that you could find, and all that type of stuff. For the PLC, the most native instructions are the logic operations on inputs and outputs, um, also the timer and counter operations. Um, the reason to start with the, with the most native thing that the CPU does is uh, because the instruction sets are very likely to be historically grown. And in fact, if you're looking at the Siemens instruction set now, um, I, get, I get a feeling of Intel's uh, because it, it's pretty much the same shit. They, they started small and then just added crap to it. And this is, and this is why you actually need to start with the uh, most basic functionality because you actually want to follow this timeline um, in order to get your stuff right and cover everything. Um, so here's an example um, of, a, of an end operation on an input 1.7 um, and you see the encoding there and the not for that and then you see if I do an end operation on an input 256 I get a four byte byte code because that's a historic development. They started to have more inputs and outputs. Um, many instructions take argument ranges, um, registers, immediates, uh, date and time formats, what have you. Um, and here's where the next preprocessor script comes in. You want to generate the ranges uh, in a script and then automatically extract um, the byte code as I showed a few minutes ago. Um, so uh, that you're not typing by hand all the time. It's almost like writing a very dumb fuzzer. So if you ever wrote a fuzzer, it shouldn't be a problem. And then you end up with something like this. So here's a couple of inputs, a couple of outputs. Um, yes, the output is actually named Q, not O, for absolutely no good reason. Um, so essentially you have the, the instructions, the arguments, then you combine them together in a script, and then what comes out goes into your SM1. 
Um, here's a word about notation when you write your, when you write your disassembler. Um, the notation is actually up to you. So it, in most cases, it makes sense to use the vendor's notation as they document um, their, their instructions. Uh, because that, you know, if someone speaks that, that language or that assembler already, then they can read what your disassembler produced, right? Uh, that's nice. And also, you can look up stuff in the documentation. That's also nice. But there's, um, and there's also cases where the vendor notation simply sucks balls. And you don't want to use the vendor notation, you want to use your own. Um, you should definitely do that, but make sure that it's clearly different from the vendor's style as well, um, so that someone familiar with this assembler, looking at the output, will immediately notice this is something different. This is, this is what this, this, this assembler shows differently than you know, the vendor tools. Um, Here's an example for uh, where notation called change. So I said load instructions are really important because we only have one accumulator. And here's a couple of variants we have here. Uh, so you can load a counter, uh, you can load the length of a data block, you can load an immediate value in different ways from memory, uh, from input, from a data block entry. A data block entry is like a struct. Um, or most complicated uh, with pointer dereferencing and uh, stuff like that. And it's not clear neither from the vendor uh, documentation nor any other material I could find whether you would consider everything after L as an argument to an L operation um, or both being, um, both being the, uh, the actual instruction. Like nobody says an instruction doesn't have a space in it. If you want instruction with space, fine. And then um, you actually have to implement what you found out, right? So you may implement your disassembly standalone, uh, which is good, gives you complete freedom, programming language, everything. Um, you, you are required to deal with everything yourself, of course, um, and you're lacking functionality that other tools might actually already provide, or you integrate into your uh, reverse engineering tool. That means you're bound by whatever choice of programming languages they provided and the API, um, you have potential integration issues and with IDA you will. Um, availability of the functionality that you already have in IDA, however, might actually help you later on. So I opted for doing the second, so I actually had to write Python. <coughs> um, yeah, it's wirklich lange. Uh, so, <laughs> IDA actually allows you to write in, in Python nowadays, even CPU modules. Um, and you, essentially what you just have to do is um, inherit a class IDA API processor T, um, give it a processor ID, um, give it a processor ID. No, there is no automatic way to find out whether this processor ID is already taken. Um, define a number of basic properties about this and then go implement a couple of functions. What you need to implement is a function uh, called emu. Um, and it's not the bird. Um, this is essentially executed when IDA wants to emulate the instruction. Um, it allows you to change things in IDB. Um, then there's two functions called out and out up. They're individually called back. Out actually outputs the mnemonic and out up then the operands. Um, you can tell it's a Russian engineering, right? No, no name is longer than it absolutely has to be. So ANA um, is then um, the analysis function that's called back on each individual instruction uh, to decode a, a function, uh, decode an instruction. It's relatively simple design. So if you take the, the small example from, um, from the IDA um, SDK directory, uh, you will be actually fine. However, you should not try to deal with IDA's representation of um, instruction sets. Um, so there is, there is a large array that you have to feed um, where all the instructions are held, and it's highly advisable to automatically generate this. 
Um, and there is, for every single decoded instruction, there is a structure called CMD that contains the effective address of the instruction and the operand. Uh, no, it's not an array, it's individual um, entries, op1, op2, and so on. Um, they can have a different type, and the type actually decides what IDA's kernel is going to do uh, with the instruction afterwards. Um, so, NDNS is surprisingly a big problem with IDA. Um, it took me more than a day um, to find the actually not documented um, global uh, data structure called INF that has a clearly not documented field MF, which I believe in Russian means NDNS. Um, <laughs> Because if you set it to one, you're a little Indian, and if you set it to zero, you're a big Indian. However, if you read data, um, so you know the instruction decoding is called, and you need another byte or two, um, the Indianness is ignored. So you need your own reading function that takes care of the Indianness. Um, so I opted to essentially do um, do two things, like write my disassembler completely um, in well, in Python I had to, um, but completely independent and have the, the IDA data structures create on startup so I don't have to deal with Ilfax wet dreams. Um, and I can actually have classes that represent instructions and stuff. Um, I'm only using um, the operand types in, in IDA where IDA doesn't try to be smart. Um, so there is the IDA spec uh, 0 to 5, which essentially it means uh, please leave it alone. Um, and I rewrote this disassembler um, two times, should probably rewrite it again, but uh, to paraphrase what Lisa once said about a piece of C code that I wrote for mod RM by decoding on the Intel platform, uh, some stuff is so ugly the code can't be beautiful. Um, it's the same here. So if your disassembler looks like shit, um, but works, you're there. It's OK. <laughs> um, so now that we can actually integrate this into IDA, um, have, some, have some deeper look at uh, what we are facing with the PLC code here. So I was, I was mentioning that there is a main organizational block that's called in every scan, right? That's the OB1. Uh, not OB1, OB1. Hmm? Um, and then there is a couple of other things. Uh, you can, in this context, you can think of a, of a PLC like a heavily interrupt-driven machine. There is, um, there is events that are real-time triggered, and then the respective code uh, blocks are called like cyclic interrupts or um, even error handling, even exceptions, um, or time-based calls. So OB35, for example, is a time-based um, organizational block that is called occasionally. Then we have functions. Functions are as one would expect them to be, um, just simple code functions. Um, they can actually take arguments, and they can actually return a value. Um, there is function blocks. They're a bit weird. So function blocks is basically a function that has a data block, um, like, a, like a struct in C, assigned to it, and then gets a instance of this data block for execution. So in, in PLC language, the function has memory. That's, that's how they call it. And then you have system function blocks and system functions um, that are provided by the system. The, you, know, you can simply call them, think of them as syscalls. So um, the data blocks, as I said, um, pretty much like structs. Um, you have instant data blocks, um, instance data blocks, <laughs> sorry. Um, those are the ones that are given to the FBs, um, and you can, I think of them as um, like, an, like an object that was made out of a class. Um, and when, um, huh? oh yeah, and you have temporal data in the, in the functions, so when you create, function, for example, you can essentially like stack variables in a C program. You can create temporary um, data points, and there's all kinds of weirdness with them. So, um, 
Calling conventions. Calling conventions can be interesting. Um, and, and here's a good case. Um, you always have to be suspicious when you're um, doing the instruction set reversing. Um, for example, when you enter call blah blah, so you're just calling an FB, which should be a very simple procedure, right? You're just calling a function. It emits all this code, everything that's read. And this is here, if you paid attention, you will see that you're seeing the markers again. And this is why you have them, and this is why they're numbered. So you can actually tell that this is a lot of code. And it's probably actually doing more than just calling something. So it actually turns out, once I had the disassembler working, <laughs> um, this is what happens. So, for example, here you have a call to a function block with a data block and um, two variables passed on. And this is all the code that's emitted. Um, the, the most interesting thing, the actual call happens uh, down there. The UC is an unconditional call um, into FB1. Um, and this is the actual call, and everything else is parameter setup. Like, this is how it passes the arguments. Interestingly enough, when you call functions, like not function blocks, but functions, it's a completely different pattern. Um, my guess is the functions came later, um, because what they do here, um, you know, last year I spoke about Flash and the most ridiculous things they do. Um, Siemens actually managed to top them. So what they do here is, <laughs> so what they do here is you see the unconditional call to SFC1, and what you see behind this, the GU, um, is a jump, a unconditional jump that jumps to this location right on top of the BLD plus eight. Um, and in the middle, they're throwing raw pointer encoded in the instruction. There is, no, there is no instruction to it, it's just argument. And they're just throwing the raw pointers in there and then jump over it so their PLC doesn't get confused about it. Ridiculous design. Um, addressing modes can be a real pain in the ass. Usually what happens is you think you're almost done with the disassembler and then you discover two more addressing modes. Um, it happened to me, <laughs> of course. Uh, so searching the internet for examples of advanced use of the programming language or environment you're looking for is very helpful. Um, I actually finally understood the, the advanced addressing modes from lecture notes that a student took because he had issues understanding them. Um, but he was pretty good documenting them. Um, so the MC7 in step 7 um, actually has local indirect addressing. So you can use like a local variable and use that as a um, as a uh, offset, so to say. Yeah, so it's it's relative. That, that was the word I was looking for. And then global indirect addressing, where it actually has an address register AR. Um, and a pointer to it, and then um, you have the same as you know from the Intel platform, uh, where you can have a register and an immediate offset. So when you put it all together, I ended up with like 463 instructions uh, that can deal with the uh, Step 7, 300, and 400 series instruction sets. Um, so far, everything looks good. Uh, everything that everyone else published on Stuxnet, um, if it actually contained code and not political guessing. Um, and they will have a screenshot of some PLC code. It is uh, pleasantly similar to my results. Um, and just to make sure that you're getting this, it's a very simple procedure, and it took the better part of three weeks. So there's absolutely no excuse if you need a disassembler for something and you can't get it, that you can't make it yourself. I showed you, it is not hard. Um, and then, when you're in IDA, this is what you get, right? Finally, you can use your um, fun little piece of software, um, Russian making, um, to read Stuxnet code. This is uh, the, the famous block C out of Stuxnet. Um, if you see the navigation band up there, um, the, the disassembly is quite happy and it even recognizes the functions as functions. Um, some of you might know the coloring. So, reading Stuxnet. <laughs> um, 
Well, what's, what's already quite known, um, it targets two specific uh, CPUs. Um, that's to distinct the target uh, that it's looking for. Um, it contains three blocks of PLC code. Two of them are pretty identical. Um, so Manic started to call them block A and B. Um, so I'm, I'm staying with their terminology here so nobody gets confused. Um, and there is a third very large block um, that is referred to as block C. And then in the pre-infection tests, it, um, it checks for a communication controller um, that is a Profi bus interface, so the, the usual architecture that you have with PLCs is you have controlling PLC and then there's some industrial ethernet or Profi bus or whatever hanging off it and there is a bunch of devices in there like variable frequency drives that run centrifuges or similar. Um, so they're checking all this up front um, in order to have their, um, their Profi bus communication backdoor uh, working nicely. And then you can, of course, take um, tools that you have that work with IDA. Um, here we have a comparison between block A and B um, using Zynamics Bindiv, and it works nicely. Um, Stuxnet has, it was pretty quickly clear that it has a fairly interesting state machine um, in its operation. Nowadays, there's the, um, extensive documentation that Symantec put out on what the state machine does. Um, however, the, the first result that I actually had when the, when the disassembler was just partially done was already that the widely published um, Deadfoot magic value um, that you could vary over the network uh, to find out whether um, a PLC is Stuxnet infected or not, uh, will actually only return this magic value um, in case of state three or four uh, within the five cases that it can have, uh, which means it actually only returns this value when it's actually fucking stuff up right now. In all the other time, which is a couple of months in some cases, it wouldn't return this value. So um, here's the benefit of writing your own disassembly. You don't have to believe the stuff other people publish. And to get you into the mood, this is the actual function that does that. So. Um, what it is, we're just quickly covering it so you get a taste for it. Um, so the first instruction actually goes ahead and opens a data block uh, with a specific number. Um, this is actually a data block. If you have that data block in your PLC, you should probably consider you know, looking deeper um, because it's not a standard data block. It's the standard Stuxnet data block. Um, then it takes a value out there, which is the state variable. So it's loading a byte. Um, loading from a data block a 16-bit value on offset 10 hex. Then it's loading a um, 3. The W um, hash 16 just means base 16. And what you see here, you have two loads after each other. Now, I said you only have one accumulator register, and nobody complained. <laughs> You're not paying attention. Um, so uh, what actually happens is, once you load into the accumulator register, the former um, contents of the accumulator registers are shifted into a secondary, because otherwise you couldn't compare shit, uh, which is what happens next. Um, it compares uh, whether the accumulator 2 is less than the accumulator 1. Um, this comparison alone um, made pretty much one, uh, one day and a sleepless night headache for me, because Siemens actually managed to document the um, the order of the operands in comparisons false. So their documentation actually says um, it's comparing ACU1 to ACU2, which is fine if you're looking for equal, because then it's shit equal. Uh, <laughs> but if you're looking for a smaller than or greater than, then you know, the code really didn't make sense because it never executed. So it's checking for, uh, in this case, three uh, compared to this value that it took off a data block, and then it performs the jump. Um, RLO is um, the result of a logic operation. This is how they, they call the flag that essentially is set to one if shit is true. Um, then it'll actually, the, the tag operation um, actually exchanges both accumulators, so you can access the one that you're not looking at right now. 
um, then it takes a four, makes the other comparison, and jumps, and in all other cases, returns the magic dead food and copies this also into the ACO2. Um, in all other cases, it just zeroes out um, the ACO registers, so even um, if you had code on a PLC intentionally checking for this, it wouldn't see anything. Uh, what's interesting is that there is, there is a number of interesting hacks that you can do with an instruction called BLD. Um, the BLD instruction actually does nothing on the device. Right? The PLC is just going to ignore it. It's like a knob, but less so. Um, what, it, what it actually is used for is by the compiler to mark um, the, the complex calls. Remember when I showed you that a call to a function block produces this shitload of code? So when you read code back out of the PLC into your programming environment, the compiler wouldn't be able to recognize this. So what they're doing is they're having an instruction for the compiler to recognize, or for the disassembler, for their own disassembler, to recognize that, oh, here's the block um, that you know, is between a BLD1 and a BLD2 instruction. This was a call to a FC with parameters. And then they're turning all the code back into the simple format. So um, it's relatively easy for, um, for people to do tricks like this. Um, you see, even on a PLC, you can do assembly level hacking. Uh, you just say BLD7 and then BLD8 and put some call in there, um, but never execute this call, but put some other code down there. This code would never be visible in Siemens tools. Now, I don't know if Symantec and other people use the Siemens tools to read the code, but it would have certainly fucked them up quite nicely. Um, interestingly enough, Stuxnet doesn't make use of any of those tricks. Um, they actually kept the BLD instructions in, uh, wasting a lot of space. Um, so they could have just taken them out, right? And on the other hand, there is a lot more calls than BLD instructions. So part of the code was very obviously developed with the Siemens development environment, while other part of the code wasn't, or it was cleaned up afterwards. Um, yeah, this is, sorry, this is what you see um, in the Siemens tool when you do this above there. Here's, a, here's part, of the, um, part of the Stuxnet code um, where you see the BLDs in action. So, there's two calls, essentially, uh, that they made to uh, update the process image input and output tables um, manually, which is pretty smart, actually, because they're, um, they're disconnecting the, the PLC from the, um, from the normal scan cycle. They disable the automatic updating of the inputs and outputs and do it by hand in order to modify uh, what the PLC thinks is on the inputs and outputs. So they're completely stealth, and the, the PLC is almost like virtualized by its own code. Pretty nicely done, actually. And then um, I was amazed to realize that, wait a minute, this code actually does have um, timestamps. The Siemens tools put timestamps onto every function when they compile. And I was Googling back and forth, and nobody seems to have noticed that yet. So uh, we can actually finally say when, when the PLC part um, of the Stuxnet code was compiled. Um, and it's consistent with all the functions. To the right, you see all the functions that got compiled. And you see from the, its, its local time, wherever it was compiled, you can see this was a clean compile run. So um, it doesn't actually look faked. Um, the, the library functions in block A and B are from 2002. Um, the dpsend function that is backdoored uh, was backdoored in 2006, and Stuxnet PLC code was compiled in September 2007. You know, you get this. <laughs> so they're, they're sitting on this since 2007. <laughs> Fuckers. Um, <laughs> What's really, what's really um, 
you know, a nice fnord is when you, when you look up the exact date it was compiled on, it was the day where Ahmadinejad had a, a famous speech at the Columbia University uh, stating that the Americans should actually look who was truly behind 9-11 and many people were really pissed. Maybe someone was pissed enough to compile. Um, <laughs> I couldn't do without a few notes about Stuxnet um, that have nothing to do with this assembler building. Um, first thing of note here is Siemens reactions. This is an official Siemens slide uh, from someone that is a program manager, hack-proof products. Um, that didn't work too well, but... Um, and essentially, uh, what you see in yellow there is the, the big question whether the customer has really done all he could have done. Uh, to prevent the infection. Um, what's also interesting is it doesn't mention any patches um, because apparently for Siemens it's totally okay if you're loading a data file into your programming environment and it executes code. Um, why would you fix that? And then a slide later, um, they're saying the same thing again, right? Um, it's have a virus scanner and otherwise it's your fucking problem. Well, how about integrity checks on a PLC? Mm. Um, I would also like to point out that I have very much respect for equality and testing um, that was done around the, the whole Stuxnet code. Um, everyone who did reliable exploitation in the wild for a specific target knows that, uh, how should I say that? Mm. Essentially, you owned half the internet that is running the software you're attacking and, and the target you're really targeting still refuses to give you a shell. That's the, the regular mode of operation in, in, in the wild exploitation. And this doesn't get easier if you pile a shitload of exploits zero day on top of each other. So there was a tremendous amount of testing involved and the same holds true for the PLC attack code. This is not trivial. They have insider knowledge that is not published. Um, they're, they're accessing um, data and data points and byte information in the PLC that is not published as what it is, but they know what it is. Um, so that was pretty good. Um, and what I think is, consider the fact that um, the PLC code was compiled in 07 and we know about other parts that they were compiled later on up to 09. Um, I'm actually thinking that there's, there has to be like a Windows GUI, um, which they then handed out and then there was some, you know, the, the cyber warriors um, that are springing up in all countries over the world. Um, they are lightly educated, um, but, but um, you know, heavily militarized. And I can totally assume that someone just, you know, went there and goes like, hmm, more is better, click, 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 more zero days, and then fire. And um, that's the whole reason this thing um, actually escaped. Uh, I wouldn't put it past a soldier to do so. Um, so what we should learn, Developing custom disassemblers is trivial, easy, and doable. <laughs> so do it. Um, what we also learn is it, it takes a third-party independent researcher to even find out that Stuxnet does something interesting. Um, so our response process um, as, as a computer security um, community actually plainly sucked. If this had been targeted against a Western nation's power grid, we would all be sitting in the dark um, and still not knowing uh, what it actually does. Um, the, I think the common estimates of O-Day burn, like how much O-Day do you burn on a single attack, uh, was way too low. <laughs> um, it was very clear that industrial control system infections were fairly easy um, because that's the, the nature um, of those things. I was really surprised to learn how complex and powerful PLCs are today. Uh, so it was really underestimated how well it can be done, um, the infection that is. And staying with this theory that um, there was a nation state behind it, I would say that if you haven't started training such a team 10 years ago, you're pretty much fucked for the next five years. Uh, so every nation state that doesn't have like those people around 
Um, good luck. Um, <laughs> Now, uh, this is QAF because I have a question for you. It, does anyone actually have tangible information why it's called Stuxnet? I mean, here's some theories, right? Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, I don't know if any of those are correct. <laughs> so if anyone knows why it is called Stuxnet, I would be really interested <laughs> because I don't. Um, does anyone? No. Well, then I'm taking questions now. So, for questions, please line up either on that handphone or come to me. Just an observation. Actually, it's Q for the output to avoid confusion with the letter zero, or with the zero. Simple as that. Okay. Well, ASCII. Um, oh, never mind. But okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll see. I learned something. Um, I also once had a problem of writing a small disassembler for a s tiny DMA engine, and I wanted to be, well, to be free software, and I was looking for a generic disassembler framework where I just could concentrate on the disassembly process, and, well, I couldn't find one, so my question is, A, do you know one, and B, if not, why don't you think there is such a Oh, you mean, you mean something uh, Which, that, not IDA, because yeah, IDA just, costs money? So, first of all, if, if I read this correct, the 5.0 version of IDA just got freeware, um, the 4.9 definitely is, so you will need to um, write and see because it's not supporting Python-based uh, CPU modules so far, but it's, you know, it's, at least it's for free downloadable. Um, I haven't looked at the, at the source code um, of HTE, but that would come to mind um, as something on a, on a Linux platform, text-based, that you could probably look, in, look into. But as I said, I've never checked the source. It might be horrible. <laughs> Did I just publicly say open source could be horrible? Sorry. Uh, other questions? Um, yeah. Just a statement. Um, first, I w uh, I'd like to thank for your great talk uh, in analyzing this stuff. And I can tell you I work in this industry. And I can say, um, yes, there is not a lot of, I would say, engineering done. It's just. Um, yeah, uh, in German we say basteln. Mm. <laughs> well. um, uh, I'm working also in try to certify devices developed according to specifications and I can tell you there's a lot of crap being done. It's like um, questions ask um, are do really do people this nasty stuff? Do I really have to test these things? And it's a lot of things to discover within the next years, I assume, especially with wireless networks coming up in these areas. Yeah, it's really interesting. <laughs> um, Wikipedia sagt in Notice 20, der Name ist buried or burned into the code. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the problem. Um, I didn't find it. Like, okay, it's a shitload of code, um, but having all the resources in the, you know, Stuxnet comes as a big DL, having all the resources decrypted and looked at, um, there's not even, like, in, in different order. Um, the, 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 um, yeah, they don't show up, the letters. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> Very nice talk. Thank you. Okay, and um, so the, the NLR, um, the NLR finale party um, is tonight. Uh, you're all welcome. Um, if you're there before midnight, uh, you get in for free. And since the sea base was too small last year, uh, we're at the Cassiopeia Club. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you all for coming, and happy disassembly of writing. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Other questions?
Um, yeah, just a statement. Um, first, I w uh, I'd like to thank for your great talk uh, in analyzing this stuff. And I can tell you I work in this industry, and I can say, um, yes, there is not a lot of, I would say, engineering done. It's just, um, yeah, uh, in German we say basteln. Mm. <laughs> well. um, uh, I'm working also in try to certify devices developed according to specifications, and I can tell you there's a lot of crap being done. It's like um, questions ask um, are do really do people this nasty stuff? Do I really have to test these things? And it's a lot of things to discover within the next years, I assume, especially with wireless networks coming up in these areas. Yeah, it's really interesting. <laughs> um, Wikipedia sagt in Notice 20, der Name ist buried or burned into the code. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the problem. Um, I didn't find it. Like, okay, it's a shitload of code, um, but having all the resources in the, you know, Stuxnet comes as a big DL, having all the resources decrypted and looked at, um, there's not even like in, in different order. Um, the, 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 um, yeah, they don't show up, the letters. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> Very nice talk. Thank you. Okay, Hi. and um, so the, the NLR, um, the NLR finale party um, is tonight. Uh, you're all welcome. Um, if you're there before midnight, uh, you get in for free. And since the sea base was too small last year, uh, we're at the Cassiopeia Club. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, thank you all for coming and happy disassembly writing. Horrible, sorry. Uh, <laughs> other questions? Um, yeah. Just a statement. Um, first, I w uh, I'd like to thank for your great talk uh, in analyzing this stuff. And I can tell you I work in this industry and I can say, um, yes, there is not a lot of, I would say, engineering done. It's just, um, yeah, uh, in German we say basteln. Mm. <laughs> well. um, uh, I'm working also in try to certify devices developed according to specifications and I can tell you there's a lot of crap being done. It's like um, questions ask, um, are, do really do people this nasty stuff? Do I really have to test these things? And it's a lot of things to discover within the next years, I assume, especially with wireless networks coming up in these areas. Yeah, it's really interesting. <laughs> um, Wikipedia sagt in Notice 20, der Name ist buried or burned into the code. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the problem. Um, I didn't find it. Like, Okay, it's a shitload of code, um, but having all the resources in the, you know, Stuxnet comes as a big DL, having all the resources decrypted and looked at, um, there's not even like in, in different order. Um, the, 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 um, yeah, they don't show up, the letters. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> Very nice talk. Thank you. Okay, and um, so the, the NLR, um, the NLR finale party um, is tonight. Uh, you're all welcome. Um, if you're there before midnight, uh, you get in for free. And since the sea base was too small last year, uh, we're at the Cassiopeia Club. Uh, yeah. So uh, thank you all for coming and happy disassembly writing. Horrible, sorry. Uh, other questions? Um, yeah. Just a statement. Um, first, I w uh, I'd like to thank for your great talk uh, in analyzing this stuff. And I can tell you I work in this industry, and I can say, um, yes, there is not a lot of, I would say, engineering done. It's just, um, yeah, uh, in German we say basteln. Mm. <laughs> well. um, uh, 
I'm working also in try to certify devices developed according to specifications and I can tell you there's a lot of crap being done. It's like um, questions ask um, are do you really do people this nasty stuff? Do I really have to test these things? And it's a lot of things to discover within the next years, I assume, especially with wireless networks coming up in these areas. Yeah, it's really interesting. Wikipedia sagt in Notice 20, der Name ist buried or burned into the code. Uh, yeah, that's that's the problem. Um, I didn't find it. Like, okay, it's a shitload of code, um, but having all the resources in the, you know, Stuxnet comes as a big DL, having all the resources decrypted and looked at, um, there's not even like in, in different order. Um, the, 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 um, yeah, they don't show up, the letters. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> Very nice talk. Thank you. Okay, and um, so the, the annual, um, the annual final aid party um, is tonight. Uh, you're all welcome. Um, if you're there before midnight, uh, you get in for free. And since the C-Base was too small last year, uh, we're at the Cassiopeia Club. Uh, yeah. So uh, thank you all for coming and happy disassembler writing. Horrible, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Other questions? Um, yeah. Just a statement. Um, first, I w uh, I'd like to thank for your great talk uh, in analyzing this stuff. And I can tell you, I work in this industry, and I can say, um, yes, there is not a lot of, I would say, engineering done. It's just, um, yeah, uh, in German we say basteln. Mm. <laughs> well. um, uh, I'm working also in try to certify devices developed according to specifications and I can tell you there's a lot of crap being done. It's like um, questions ask um, are do you really do people this nasty stuff? Do I really have to test these things? And it's a lot of things to discover within the next years, I assume, especially with wireless networks coming up in these areas. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, Wikipedia sagt in Notice 20, der Name ist buried or burned into the code. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the problem. Um, I didn't find it. Like, okay, it's a shitload of code, um, but having all the resources in the, you know, Stuxnet comes as a big DL, having all the resources decrypted and looked at, um, there's not even like in, in different order. Um, the, 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 um, yeah, they don't show up, the letters. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> Very nice talk. Thank you. Okay, and um, so the, the annual, um, the annual final aid party um, is tonight. Uh, you're all welcome. Um, if you're there before midnight, uh, you get in for free. And since the sea base was too small last year, uh, we're at the Cassiopeia Club. Uh, yeah. So uh, thank you all for coming and happy disassembly writing. Uh, something on a, on a Linux platform, text-based, that you could probably look, in, look into. But as I said, I've never checked the source. It might be horrible. <laughs> Did I just publicly say open source could be horrible? Uh, something on a, on a Linux platform, text-based, that you could probably look, in, look into. But as I said, I've never checked the source. It might be horrible. <laughs> Did I just publicly say open source could be home? Uh, something on a, on a Linux platform, text-based, that you could probably look, in, look into. But as I said, I've never checked the source. It might be horrible. <laughs> Did I just publicly say open source could be home? Uh, something on a, on a Linux platform, text-based, that you could probably look, in, look into. But as I said, I've never checked the source. It might be horrible. <laughs> 
Did I just publicly say open source could be home? Uh, something on a, on a Linux platform, text-based, that you could probably look, in, look into. But as I said, I've never checked the source. It might be horrible. <laughs> Did I just publicly say open source could be home? Uh, something on a, on a Linux platform, text-based, that you could probably look, in, look into. But as I said, I've never checked the source. It might be horrible. <laughs> Did I just publicly say open source could be horrible? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> other questions? Um, yeah. Just a statement. Um, first, I w uh, I'd like to thank for your great talk uh, in analyzing this stuff. And I can tell you I work in this industry. And I can say, um, yes, there is not a lot of, I would say, engineering done. It's just, um, yeah, uh, in German we say basteln. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. And uh, I'm working also in try to certify devices developed according to specifications and I can tell you there's a lot of crap being done. It's like um, questions ask um, are, do really do people this nasty stuff? Do I really have to test these things? And it's a lot of things to discover within the next years, I assume, especially with wireless networks coming up in these areas. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, Wikipedia sagt in Notice 20, der Name ist buried or burned into the code. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the problem. Um, I didn't find it. Like, okay, it's a shitload of code, um, but having all the resources in the, you know, Stuxnet comes as a big DL, having all the resources decrypted and looked at, um, there's not even, like, in, in different order. Um, the, 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 um, yeah, they don't show up, the letters. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> Very nice talk. Thank you. Okay, and um, so the, the analog, um, the NLR finale party um, is tonight. Uh, you're all welcome. Um, if you're there before midnight, uh, you get in for free. And since the C base was too small last year, uh, we're at the Cassiopeia Club. Uh, yeah. So uh, thank you all for coming and happy disassembly writing. Okay, now all that's done. We all know you're here for the big show. Give FX a huge round of applause for the schooling on disassemblies he's going to give you right now. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. Um, so, uh, welcome to tutorial session. I am a little bit surprised at how many people actually want to build custom disassemblers. Uh, <laughs> But that's a good development. Um, so um, what I'm, what I'm going to cover is not just building a disassembler, but building a disassembler for an instruction set where you don't have a documentation. Um, with most instruction sets, um, you do get a documentation. And why are my slides cut off? Uh, that is suboptimal. Anyway, so um, you're missing the bullet points. <laughs> um, so we're going to um, quickly talk about the motivation behind this talk, um, an introduction to the, to the field. Um, it, is, it is not a regular CPU that you're dealing with on a daily basis, so um, we have to cover a little bit of groundwork. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how we find the bytecode, how we recognize it, how we see basic properties of the bytecode, um, how we implement an IDA, um, an accumulator register. Newer ones have more than one accumulator register, but you can't address them directly. Um, modern PLCs, as, as I had to learn the hard way, are a lot more complex. So how do you program those? This is fairly interesting. Um, the programming of PLCs um, 
So the PLCs are all vendor specific. However, the programming is actually standardized um, by the IEC um, in the 61131 standard. Um, they also standardized other interesting stuff like uh, VHS video and uh, 19 inch racks. Um, and what they, what they define is a set of programming languages. The first one is the uh, most common, commonly known ladder diagram. That's what you see up here. Um, it actually looks like an electrical engineering um, wire up painting. Um, then there's the function block diagram. This is from Wikipedia. This is actually part of the, um, of the Genesis project, uh, Gemini project. Uh, from NASA, they somehow gave it to Wikipedia for whatever reason. Um, to the English one, of course. Um, the Germans deleted it. Um, <laughs> the, then you have a, um, a, a structured text representation that you can write in that pretty much looks like Pascal uh, with all its beauty. Um, then you have the instruction list, uh, which is the closest you can get to the feeling of an assembly. And then you have a sequential code, or shut the fuck up. Um, <laughs> and so in, in the Stuxnet uh, code, uh, there were a couple of blobs that were apparently PLC code. And those needed to be analyzed. And um, the, analyze, uh, and the, the information that you could get off the internet wasn't really reliable and wasn't actually coming in. Um, the speed that uh, was required to figure out what Stuxnet actually does. So, intro, now we need to look at PLCs, right? Um, the stuff that I learned PLCs on in professional school is actually like this little thing to the right. Um, it's a very simple um, programmable input-output controller, essentially. It's designed for electrical engineers, um, not for programmers. and. It's actually just designed to um, virtualize, as we would say today, um, and abstract a fixed wiring um, configuration of an automatism. Um, the, the default axis, um, you have digital inputs and outputs that you can program, and there's mostly there's some um, analog um, digital converters connected to them, and then you can you know, drive motors or pumps or dildos or whatever. Um, you can actually do that. Um, <laughs> so it's from a from a programming perspective, um, it's a it's one register machine. It actually has um, usually only one register. So function chart. Uh, you can already see that it's fairly complicated um, just to you know uh, use a sequential function chart just to open and close the door um, manually. <laughs> that is. Um, the IEC also defines a standard set of libraries. Um, think of it like your libc. Um, there's just a standard set of um, instructions, um, functions. So the PLCs actually don't natively execute, um, execute the code that you're putting on them. Uh, most of the older ones that are still in use actually emulate the code. So there is there is an actual operating system layer, thin layer on top of the real hardware. Um, the the real modern ones um, now use ASICs uh, that can natively execute this uh, this bytecode. And what you need to keep in mind with PLCs is that they execute in so-called scans. So um, you don't have a continuous execution as you would expect it from a regular CPU, but you have a, like a hamster wheel uh, cycle that goes, it reads all the inputs, converts them, you know, you have an analog input. Uh, if you digitalize it, you need to set a defined point in time uh, when you take the measurement. And this is what is done first. Um, then the main code is executed with all the other code that might be called from the main block. Um, and then the outputs are set according to what the code did, right? Relative to the CPU module um, to put the disassembler into IDA. Um, oh, great. Thanks for fixing it. Um, and um, some more advanced topics that you're going to face if you want to write like a complete disassembler and then we end up reading some code that we're not supposed to read. Um, so the, the general motivation is like this. This is what you get and IDA tells you, um, I don't know what to make of it. The story behind this is a little bit embarrassing um, because it taught me that I'm no longer a teenage hacker. Um, 
I got a call from a friend um, who worked on um, the Stuxnet case. And he asked me whether um, I know any old fart, that was his saying, that still learned PLCs, um, which happened to match to myself. Uh, <laughs> so I ended up dealing with this part of it. Um, so more specifically, um, in June 14 this year, uh, Frank Baldwin, a um, independent researcher who's not working for antivirus companies, um, actually figured out that um, the, the antivirus companies were so um, busy jerking off about the fact that there was an LNK zero day in Stuxnet that they completely missed the fact that it had payload that actually did something interesting. Um, a lot of people started speculating um, about Stuxnet and still do. Uh, very few people actually read the code. Um, here's, here's a general recommendation. Um, read the 